Um, yeah, I'll <coughs> I'll try to keep it somewhat brief this morning, but uh, just as I got up here and, and looked down at my at my notes, um, I immediately thought of one more passage that I'll need to visit before we land, so I'm, I'm turning to it right now. Um, we are going to travel about a little bit, but we're going to springboard off of um, three verses there in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. We'll just start by, by reading there. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the he your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, being Father's Day, and you know, we, we, we sing about God being a, a good, good Father, and he is the, the pinnacle of fatherhood. He is the one by which every, every one of us, those of us that had, that had good fathers, I mean, I'm talking about good fathers in the sense of, of they were good providers, they were good protectors, they were, they were good and godly men who, who gave us an example and who provided a, showed us a way forward. They, they raised us in the admonition of the Lord that when we were older, we would not depart from it. Those kind of fathers those kind of fathers, we talked a little bit along these lines in, in Mother's, on Mother's Day. Uh, none of us had perfect fathers. You know, I had a good one. I hope you had a good one. But if you did not, and to the degree that you did not, you are comparing those disappointments that our, our fathers made towards us. My disappointments in my own being a father for my children, I was far from a perfect father, and, and I guess I, I still am in, in that sense that you never stop being a father, even though you're done raising your children, you're, you're still their, their father as they go on into adulthood. When we make that comparison, what, why is it that anybody would be disappointed and the total disappointment ultimately is going to be the discrepancy between the father in the flesh, whether that's speaking of you as you are a parent to another or yours to you, the discrepancy between yourself and God. God's brand of fatherhood is perfect as everything about God is. God is the perfect father. So whether we, we may be disappointed even in our heavenly father. It's entirely possible to be, I mean, there are people all over, I was going to say all over the nation, all over the world, but all over the church, there are people who are disappointed in their heavenly father because they thought he would do this thing and he didn't. And if God really loved me, he would have, and you fill in the blank. And then there's those, those, those disappointments, those things that are just glaring uh, absences that why didn't God, and that's basically what's being addressed in this passage of scripture here. <laughs> it says, if, if you have a son, you, you being, and he says, he calls us evil. And this is another one of those, it's not exactly hyperbole where it's an exaggeration for effect, but it's not far from it. You know, he, he's, he's speaking to the very best of the people 
of his society. He's speaking to those who, who are even the learned, even the very religious, those who have their you know, eyes dotted and their T's crossed, who are tithing of mint and cumin out of their garden. They're going, they're going through their garden plants. And those that you harvest leaves from, they're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The Lord's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The Lord's. I mean, they're they're really paying attention. These are the people that that Christ is speaking to when He says this, and He says, "You being evil." So the comparison there is whatever you compare to God is going to be evil by comparison. And that's the, it's called an idiom. It is called a, a verbal or a linguistic vehicle for making a comparison. So what he is saying is, it's not like you're evil and I want you to believe that you're totally bad and there's nothing good about you. And because of that, I am all of this in comparison it is actually the opposite. He says, no matter how good you are in comparison to the father, you're always going to be evil. Yet you want good things for your children. And it's only the most evil among us who, who do not want good things for their children. I mean, that's as natural as what we talked about, you know, a natural mother's love. The desires of a father for his children are that they would receive that which they need, that he would have grace upon himself to be able to provide them that which they need. And here Jesus is walking them through this and he's saying, okay, if you be an evil wouldn't give harmful things or unbeneficial things even to your children, how much more will God not hold out on you? And here he, he says something, and this account is in at least two of the gospels. And in the other account, he doesn't answer it exactly the same way, but I think this is the implication either route you go he says, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How many, how many people ask the father for the Holy Spirit? I mean, there, there is a there is a, a sense in which, especially coming from the church tradition that we do, we, we know that when I was born again, I was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I was given the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. I, he, he dwells with me. I walk with him. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. But here Jesus is giving them, not just in that moment, but an ongoing declaration that if you ask the Heavenly Father for Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit shows up, manifests himself in very real and tangible ways. Um, This relationship that we have to the Father is very instinctual for us because we had a Father, good, bad, or somewhere in the middle, we had a Father. Therefore, we had expectations of a Father, and we know that our Heavenly Father is the ultimate in fathering. But look at what He does when He sees His children in need. Because these were legitimate things to be asking a father for. He says, if, if he asks, <clears throat> if he asks for bread, in other words, if he asks for food, if, if, he, if he's going to give it bread, 
You wouldn't give him a stone. Goes on, fish, if you some sort of meat, you're not going to give him a serpent. Ask for an egg, give him a sort scorpion that might sting and and bring pain. You're, you're not going to you're not going to respond in that way. And then he wants us very simply to know how God the Father, when we go to him requesting the things that are needful for us, those things which we need, we know that there's a certain area where we're weak and we need power in an area for, we all need greater power in forgiving our enemies, for living in an unoffended way before the Lord and, and just taking all of the things that are heaped at us and, and laying them out before the Lord and saying, you know, I, I forgive. I will not take offense. I, I will follow your will and your ways. How do we do that? Well, we do that by the power of of the Holy Spirit that is imparted to us. Now, he says that he will give the Holy Spirit to them. How does he give the Holy Spirit to someone who already has his abiding presence with them? Now, this is very real. It's not like that we are, we are saved and then at some point, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. He is the person of our salvation. He is the one that makes Jesus real to us. He is the transformer of our hearts. Uh, again, a word that I like to use that doesn't get a lot of usage in, to, in today's preaching, but our conversion, the converting, the regeneration, the converting from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, that was Holy Spirit. He is the agency of God the Father. It, it, it's Father, Son, who is the Word. So it, it's the Father who wills the thing. It's the Son who speaks that thing. And it's the Holy Spirit who is the agency to accomplish the thing that the Father desires, that the Son speaks. The Holy Spirit accomplishes that. So He is sent on mission in your life. It doesn't matter that He's already there. He sent on mission to accomplish a thing in your life. And here we are told to ask for that. There, there is a, a certain amount of expectation to believe that, well, you know, Holy Spirit's in me. If he wants to do something, he can do whatever he wants to. I am open. I am willing that Holy Spirit would do some stuff in me. But do we ask? Do, do we see the needs in our life? And do we ask? I want to take a, a little trip through more scriptures than what I came with this morning. I do have one more I want to tuck in here, but I don't think it'll take long. I want to first go to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to look at four verses there in Romans chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. And this is... Holy Spirit to us. Th this sense that, that God says that he will send the Holy Spirit to those who ask. He is sending them, he is sending him to accomplish something in this. And his, this is how he comes to us. It says here, for, for hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom is given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, and scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God's love to us. Holy Spirit is sent to us so that we can experience the love of God. The reality of the cross. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for who? 
Christ died for the righteous. Christ died for the good and, and the upstanding within our society. No, Christ died for the ungodly. We were sinners, ungodly, had no hope in the world. And God steps in and by his Holy Spirit, he brings that truth to bear in us. He brings the knowledge of his love. I am convinced that one of the things that each and every one of us need to be ever increasingly convinced of is the love of God. And, and I know I, I wear this out, but I feel it is so fundamental that every opportunity I need to slide this in under is the foundation for what I'm teaching in the moment. And it is this, the fall, our first parents, what was, what was the real source? Was it how good the food looked? Was it how desirous that it was to be, uh, to make one wise? I mean, was those the things that got our first parents to take the forbidden and take it to themselves? No, it was, it was the evil one's lie. God doesn't want you to be like him, knowing both good and evil. In other words, God is holding out on you. God is not this good, good father who will give you only the best, which is to say he will only supply himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. He will answer your prayers by the Holy Spirit. For years now, I've looked at this scripture in this way, and I have searched many times for the prayers that I have prayed and the prayers that other people have prayed in my presence. And if God answers those prayers in the affirmative, those prayers will be answered by him sending the Holy Spirit on mission. We began the service today praying for the healing, praying for the strengthening, praying for the perseverance of those that were inflicted in many different ways. God hearing our prayers will answer them. And how does he do so? He sends Holy Spirit on mission. That, that, that may be a person who the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in and the Holy Spirit touches that life and brings truth, brings light, brings healing, brings hope, brings knowledge, brings whatever is needed in the moment. He shows up in a very personal way on mission and accomplishes that thing. If that person is walking with God, if they're a follower of Christ, therefore they're being led by the Spirit, same Holy Spirit shows up in that circumstance, manifesting himself in strength, in knowledge, in power, in all the ways that he has available to him. He can, he can do anything God can do because he is God. Therefore, when he comes on mission in answer to our prayers to the Father, he will accomplish. This is the same Holy Spirit that brooded over the voidless or the void and, and formless earth and brought forth creation. This is the one that's being sent in answer to our prayer. I hope no one is disappointed that when you pray to God, his answer is always to send the Holy Spirit. Well, I was wanting enough cash to pay my bills. Well, okay. But, you know, Holy Spirit is the agency. He will come with wisdom as to how to, he, he will come, it, say, say it's something that ordinary, that this life that you are standing in need of. And those are real concerns. You know, our, our finances can get in a shape that, that they become real concerns to us. So what we reach out to the Father and he answers, he sends Holy Spirit. Because if it, it's a problem with our management of what we already have, he'll bring correction to that and over time shift us. I mean, we've experienced this. We've experienced this in, in our life because we had children. We had one income. We had lots of Lots of food bills. If you've seen our boys, you know what I'm talking about. That was not a, an easy chore to, to feed that bunch. 
And there's all of these things that you feel like you need. You feel like your kids deserve these things. So you step out beyond it and then, you know, you, you, you get yourself in, in a bind. And I could have easily continued to spend beyond our means right through to the day. Now I'm in a whole different position at work, substantially more income, but I've watched the people around me and people with a lot higher income collectively than, than what we have live paycheck to paycheck. Why is it? Holy Spirit came to us with wisdom out of his word and showed us a way to live, showed us a way to order our finances so that this would not be an issue. But it could easily happen. You know, through, through health or through job loss or whatever, we could be plunged into a situation and we might be again praying for an answer in the area of finances. And, and it might be that Holy Spirit would go to a half a dozen of you and say, you know, Tracy and Kathy really fell on, fell on hard times and you really ought to give them something. That'd be the Holy Spirit. That'd be the Holy Spirit that would be doing that in answer to our prayers. But you see what I mean? Every, he is the agency. He is always the one who is going to be sent. And he sent to us in a very primary, a very not just primary, but primal function of convincing us of the love of God. He is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It is through his agency that God the Father's love touches us and convinces us that he can be trusted. When all of our circumstances look like it's going the opposite direction that, that we want it to go and that we feel God would have it to go, we can trust him because Holy Spirit is on the inside manifesting God's love, convincing you of God's love. When you know the love of the Father, you can trust him to take you through anything. You can trust him to take you, yea, through the valley of the shadow of death. Yes, you can go through death itself with the Father if convinced of his love. Now, I've shared this story a few times over the years, but not long after we got here, Ruth Sylvie had, had really took a, a nosedive in her health, and there were several of us went to the hospital, and I had the privilege of going in to her room with Roger Bartley. Of course, I didn't know Ruth very well at all. I'd probably only seen her a half a dozen times that she'd been able to attend since I started pastoring here. But Roger had a long track record with her and he walks in and they kicked off conversation. And it was one of the most glorious things I think I've ever seen in my life. I mean, Ruth and him were talking and, and she was talking to me. She basically knew that, you know, that likely before morning, she was going to be in the Lord's presence. And it was, as a matter of fact, as me talking about going home and finding my kids there after service today. You know, kids are going to show up for Father's Day, and that's going to be a, a great thing. I can't wait to see them. Uh, and I have no misgivings about the drive home. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be fine to get there. It just And... You could tell Holy Spirit was present in her to make her know on the inside, that's the door. That's the door. That's the door into not the great unknown, but the great known. That so far surpasses what we know that there's nothing but anticipation there. I can think of another another brother who, who came to the Lord late in life. I worked with him out at Radiac, Ed Webb. And he was, we, we gathered around his bed and he's like, pray for me, guys, pray for me. He says, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of fears about what's standing between me and getting there. 
that I don't know what this is going to be like to die, but he was sure it was coming as we were, but he had zero, <laughs> zero misgivings about you know, getting there. You know, if, if I can just, I know it would be quite a shock for me because I'm satisfied the Lord would never let this woman go before me, but it'll come become quite a shock to her to wake up and, and find a corpse laying beside her. But hey, if that's, I mean, I just want to draw my legs up into bed, roll over, fall asleep, and find that I'm in the presence of Jesus. Pray for grace for you to get through that. But, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll just have one quick twinge enough to cry out, and then they'll wake you up, and then you won't be <laughs> just cold or something. You know. Put some thought into this. <laughs> I have to put a little thought into this. Yeah. I know I don't want to drown. I don't want to burn up. There's some things I don't want to do. But if I got to pick, which none of us do, if I got to pick, it would just be peace out. You know, <laughs> turn out the light, wake up in heaven. That, that would be the that would be the chosen path. I can't even remember where I was headed with that. <laughs> But what I do know is everything, if I, what I do know is whatever comes into my life is coming through the hands of a loving father that only has my best at heart. This passage of scripture we're looking at this morning shows that. He's not, we're not going to ask him for one thing and he gives us another. He's going to send the Holy Spirit with exactly what we need. And we need first and foremost to be fully convinced of the depth of his love. That his love is like all of his other attributes. His love is infinite. And it's without reservation. Then God's love through us so most of the time when we're, when we're praying in the things that in relationship to others, it will be Holy Spirit showing up in us, manifesting himself through us to impact the lives of others. And I'm going to be brief here because this could take till September. But um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 there's that passage that talks about the manifestation of the Spirit. Spirit's present in the life of the believer. These things that many times get assigned to be gifts are manifestations of the gift. Holy Spirit, He is the gift to the believer and his man the manifestations of His Spirit are that which in, in answer to prayer to the Father Holy Spirit is sent to manifest himself in the life of the believer in a multiplicity of ways as the Father chooses. He sends him on assignment to accomplish these things through the life of the believer for the purpose of the edifying of the body of Christ in love. It's to build up the body. But the manifestations of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Just real briefly on this subject, as he wills. There is a whole movement 
with, within Christianity, the believes all of this stuff is just relegated to the past, to the past, to this one generation of the apostles, and that God doesn't do this stuff anymore. God can do this and infinitely more than this at his choosing through any yielded believer. You have Holy Spirit in you. He is the love of God that has been shed abroad in your hearts. He, he is present. So being present, he can do that which he will. But when he was going, if he's going to do that, he will do that as the Father wills. And as his people pray and act, we want to see people touched by God. But we tend to want to go to God in prayer and say, God, you go touch their life. You, you bring the knowledge of your truth to them. God, bring them to salvation, bring them to the knowledge of the of the work of the Son of God being the sacrifice that they need. Bring them to the knowledge of sin. Bring them to God. You do that. Those are good, right, and righteous prayers. But how do you think God answers those prayers? Our good, good Father sends Holy Spirit. To that individual, you bring peace and grace to my brother or sister in Christ who are going through a great struggle. Does God do that? Yeah, he's already present there. He's already there to manifest peace that passes understanding in that person. But it's a very real, I was going to say possibility, but it's, it's a probability more than it is a possibility. If it's on your heart to pray for that individual, God has something for you to do in the midst of that. And you can only accomplish that. It is a God-sized task. You know that only God can bring that kind of peace. Only God can bring the knowledge of himself experientially to that individual. Only God can give this person wisdom in a certain way. Only God can do that. But he wants to use you to do that. And he put it on your heart to pray for it. Therefore, the answer to that prayer very well may be he stirs up Holy Spirit within you to accomplish that thing in the life of that other person that you're praying for. <laughs> Holy Spirit, the love of God showing up through us. And, and I... I'm reluctant to even use that uh, terminology because, you know, you, you hear people talk about, you know, God was really among us this morning. Well, God's everywhere all the time. And he's always with me. And I trust that he's always with you. So we, we showed up together, God. We know what we mean by that, though. What we mean is, the manifest presence of God. You, you know that somebody is there, but when they speak up and participate in what's going on, when they stand up and act in, in the work that's going on, then they're, then they're there in a whole different way than just being present. They're present and working. They're present and functioning. They're the manifest presence of the Lord being in the midst. When, when you hear somebody say something about God showing up, don't dismiss that out of hand. Don't dismiss that as small-minded thinking by, by people who, who think that Holy Spirit blows in and blows out of a, a, a situation like we're sitting in this morning. Do not dismiss that as a lack of understanding on the other person's part. Because if you want to dismiss that, it very well may be a misunderstanding on your part. Because the God who is always with us, the God who is always near, the God who is always active, 
will manifest his power in specific ways as he desires. We get, we, we show up this morning. We have a, a, a good worship time together. We leave. Somebody asks you, how did the service go? And what's your answer going to be? Well, that, that's as varied as, as we are as individuals. But some people will say, oh, God was really there and evident in the midst of his people this morning. I was so touched by what God did. By, by, by those two songs or by that one thing that Tracy said or, or that one thing that was testified to that really touched me. I really felt the Lord was there in the midst this morning. That's the manifest presence of the Lord. And he manifests himself to each one and he can be manifested through each one. When you leave this place today, you are on mission. Somebody will have prayed and you very well may be the answer to somebody else's prayer. Somebody may be praying, I I'm lonely and I, I, I just need to spend some time with somebody and suddenly somebody that hadn't crossed your mind in days or weeks comes to mind. You think, I just need to stop by and see them. I, I need to stop by and just let them know I, I, I care. Let them know I'm there for them and, and ask them if they need anything. And you show up and you're the answer. You're God's answer to prayer. But ultimately, it was Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit that's in you to accomplish much of that which you're going to see accomplished in the kingdom of God is going to happen in that way. I'm not going to break down all the varied gifts, and I, but I do want to... I do want to ensure you or ensure to you that this is not a complete list. There are many things not listed specifically here that the Holy Spirit can do in and through you. Some of them much more naturally seem natural seeming. First, the first mention of, of the Holy Spirit's anointing upon people was on craftsmen for the building of the for tabernacle furniture. To, to be able to do those things, to be able to build a, a golden candlestick with a reservoir with internal tubing that the oil went out through to light all of those lights and, and to be able to feed, feed each of those wicks without it pouring out and setting the whole place on fire, but never running out at, at the, by the same measure, that was not natural. That was supernatural giftings in a very natural pursuit. We, we look at something like that and say, well, you know, that's just skill. That's just the craft of man's hands. That's not something more. Well, it was. It took Holy Spirit to produce that. So it, it very well may be that some of the skill that you have can be employed in a very supernatural way by the Holy Spirit. I don't want to over spiritualize the effects of the Holy Spirit's being sent as an answer to prayer. Okay, I did mention one other passage and it's the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Holy Spirit, the love of God shed abroad in your heart. Love is a fruit of the Spirit's presence in our life. So when we pray or someone else prays and God sends Holy Spirit to be active through one of us, because he, he can manifest, he manifests his love to me by his Holy Spirit with no agency from any of you. But he also shares his love with me through many of you. So it's not an either or. God's love comes to us 
directly from his person and through the agency of brothers and sisters in Christ that he's brought us into fellowship with. And, and that's the main reason that I wanted to go to here as well. These things that seem natural to our newly created nature in Christ to, to express be expression of love, to bring peace into a chaotic situation, to, to bring kindness where kindness is needed, to do any of these, to express any of these gifts, to be in, to be in control when everything is out of control, just complete chaos and you step in with peace and self-control. And then the, the gift side of it, the, the manifestation of the Spirit manifesting itself through wisdom. Wisdom is expressed through us as we maintain our self-control in the spirit of peace. Holy Spirit's just showed up in the middle of that and he'll look a whole lot like you when he does it. This, this was my landing scripture, so we're, we're coming to the end. Back to, back to Luke 11, verses 9 and 10, just preceding the ones that we started with. It says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And it's, I have no idea how this works in, um, in Greek, the, the original language that it was written to, but it's really convenient that this is written in English for us because ask, seek, knock spells out ask. The first letter is an acronym so just think about, think about when you, when you feel a desire that you need to go to your heavenly father and ask for him to dispense something to you, he, he desires to be employed. You, you have not fully asked until you have asked and you've sought it and you've knocked. You've looked for the opportunity. You've wanted the door to open. You, you don't just passively act or ask, you actively ask by employing all three of these steps. And man, do I wish I had another 45 minutes to, to dive into that, but we don't. So I'm going to close in prayer. Lord, I just thank you this morning for, for your great love with which you have loved us, Lord, for your example of perfection, Lord, in fatherhood and for provision. Lord, and we just trust that, that you provide everything we need through the agency of the Holy Spirit, through the authority that you've given to your son, Lord. So we come to you in Jesus' name this morning, trusting your sending Holy Spirit to accomplish all of your goodwill and purpose in each of us. And Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord, to be able to see the opportunities that we have to be your hand extended, to be your mouthpiece, Lord, to be those who can, who others could feel the tangible touch of your hand through our hand, Lord. Lord, we desire to touch the lives of others in a meaningful kingdom-centered way, Lord, and we trust that Holy Spirit is that which you've ordained. He, he is the one that you have ordained to be present in us to answer the prayers, our own and others, Lord. So God, we just pray that you would make us yielded vessels to that end, Lord, that we would be all that you've called us to be and nothing less, Lord. And we trust you in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and fathers have a